Hi, when I was trying the Windows subsystem for Linux, that's not you. I okay. Um, <laughs> I noticed right away I wanted to use like a, a GUI, like um, you know, like uh, IntelliJ or something like that, and so I needed my source code to be kind of on the Windows side. Mm -hmm. But then as soon as I'm like editing it, because it's on the Windows side, I don't have Linux permissions. And so when I'm committing it to Git, and then everyone else is using Mac or Linux, and then they're pulling it down, you know, they're seeing permissions on the files. It might be a little bit wonky. Has this, like, how does this happen in real life? And does everyone set up their IDE to get the file linings, Linux, uh, Unix based, Default and like all those kind of yeah. weird interop features? Yeah. So first off, that's a great question, and also the type of um, weird boundary conditions that we've been working through a lot in the past year or two. So like the things you're describing are the difference between anniversary update, creators update, fall creators update, et cetera, et cetera. So in insider builds and soon to be the next build, we've actually added a pile of code to handle Linux permissions correctly, so now we don't clobber that metadata. So if you want to go through and set things to whatever file permissions you want to be consistent on the Linux side, you can now do that and Windows respects those permissions. Um, also, when you're editing code in a Windows text editor like IntelliJ, by default you do get Windows style line endings, but it should be true that because you're in the same IDE the entire time, it's consistent. Mm -hmm. um, Git already has to work between environments, so Git for Windows checks out uh, Windows style, checks in Linux style, and it does that conversion for every project regardless of which side you're running on. So if you're doing, as long as you have consistent experiences, you shouldn't run into too many of those seams. So if you're consistently doing editing in a code editor running on Windows against data that you are building with Linux tools, that should work. If you are consistently doing text editing in, say, Vim in the subsystem, so you're using Linux style line endings, et cetera, et cetera, consistently, that should also work. If you open a file in Vim and you do a pile of editing on the Linux side, you open it up in IntelliJ, IntelliJ on Windows, you probably won't have the right line endings, for example. But as long as you use consistent patterns for development, you shouldn't run into that too often and Git fixes a lot of that for you. With that said, as I said, this is exactly the type of thing that we've been working on a lot lately. So please, please, please send me a message, file feedback on Feedback Hub, file you know, like requests and user voice. Like keep giving us feedback, that way we can prioritize yes. and fix these things. And it works well with VS Code. I mean, I just set my default path to be the bat Windows Linux subsystem. I have no problems. So um, it's a nice feature. Cool. Um, I, I have a big and complicated Webpack 3 config file. Uh, and I spend a lot of time getting everything working. And it runs uh, test runners and uh, has a production mode and developer mode and different kinds of source maps you can use in different circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, is any of that going to break if I just switch to Webpack 4? No, well, okay, so there's going to be breaking changes for plugins that you use if they're not like a major major upgrade. So like for example, um, because we wrote, rewrote the plugin system in this major release, all plugins will have to be using, well, to, for the most part, you'll either see a deprecation warning or if it's a plugin like HTML Webpack plugin, which has already upgraded to their V3, um, th that would break. But we already have that patched. And that functionality, should say. So what about Webpack or the um, Extract Text plugin, which you mentioned is uh, to be replaced in the future? Yes. So we have the mini CSS Extract plugin. Um, today, we're recommending that people use that instead. The Unless you have very specific functionality, which we would encourage you, if it breaks in any way, to submit an issue because we want to fix it. Um, but otherwise, uh, from the testing and all the CLIs that I've tried out so far, um, I've been able to just replace it with the mini CSS extract plugin with no issues. <laughs> He's like, I'm on my way. <laughs> Hello, I'm just undergrad, but when you guys are developing new tools and projects and putting stuff out, how do you know like when is enough to put out and like, because you said that you have limited functionality sometimes for the new products you're pushing, so like when do you know like this is where it should be and like how do you benchmark and figure out what should go out and how much to work to put in so that you have like that. good interaction with your customers? Was that like a reference to what I said about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's, true, yeah. <laughs> um, that's a nuanced question. Okay. Um, it's a great question, but it's a nuanced question. Um, 
The easiest answer is by engaging with customers and understanding what they would consider to be a valuable product. You hear this like in agile development, there's the idea of an MVP, um, a minimum viable product, some people say, but I think a, a better version of it is minimum valuable product. So to know value, you have to be in touch with the people for whom value matters. And part of what we do and what we're increasingly doing as a culture, and I think what we even on the web platform team sort of exemplify is being uh, transparent and actively engaging with our community, whether we put on conferences or um, you know, we come to events like these or we have open and transparent communication uh, mechanisms like our edge issue tracker and feedback hub and things like that. We keep our pulse on um, in, in both a um, proactive and reactive way on how people perceive what we do. And in response to those perceptions, we shift what is considered a minimum valuable product. So the easiest answer is by listening to you guys, we figure that out. That said, for EDP in particular, um, and this is particularly the case with brand new products, um, things that have never existed before, we do tend to define that a little bit ourselves um, and not sometimes, especially if it's like, you've probably heard that adage that like, you know, before the iPod came around, people didn't know that's what they wanted. Um, and so sometimes you like uh, can't necessarily rely on customers to tell you what they want because you are supposed to be the innovators where, you know, we work at Microsoft or Google or whatever. You're like, you're supposed to build the cool things and you can't just go to customers all the time and say, well, what do you want, right? Like, why are we paid so much if we just go to you guys all the time? So I think there is this constant balance between intuition and data that we look at, um, and we're constantly trying to perfect the data systems that we have out in the wild uh, and add to them um, based on a constant feedback loop. But the easiest answer, I would say, is indeed based on what you guys tell us. Um, but sometimes, yeah, we do, like with EDP in particular, we decided, um, that with this first release, it was important for us to verify the platform, to build the underlying architecture, and the experiences we built in Visual Studio and in the Edge Dev tools, we know aren't enough for some developer to go out and perform their day job on it. We're, we're very aware of that as developers ourselves. Um, but sometimes you need um, projects which prove some higher order goal um, and in this case, that's what we did here. We chose to shrink down the actual sort of functionality that would exist in these clients in order to prove out the underlying system of the WebSocket server and the HTTP server um, so that we didn't ship too much too fast and sort of crumble in upon ourselves. <laughs> um, so yeah, again, it's a nuance, it's a nuance question. Uh, it's a great one, but um, primarily customer data and then our intuition. Thank you. Yeah. That's a good answer. Yeah, more Get people. Get in line, yeah. yeah. Come on. <laughs> See, taken. No. My Good. ego goes up a little bit every time someone asks a question. There you go. <laughs> uh, I don't know anything about developing on Windows. What all do I need to learn to get started with WSL? Uh, Everyone grab a drink. I can tell. Yeah. Uh, I was about to say, there's really good wine over there. No. Yeah. Um, so to, to get started with WSL, you need to know the, well, Actually, we have documentation. So if you can find the documentation, you can copy paste oh. all of the commands mm -hmm. that you need in order to get started. So I was going to say you need to know how to enable a oh, optional right. feature, but that's not entirely true. You could copy pasta and get started that way. Um, so yeah, the basics of how to enable a role, an optional role and feature. Um, other than that, you're opening up a command prompt and installing a distro from the store. So if you follow that pattern from then on out, you can use, if you wanted to, you could live entirely in Linux paradigms for the actual development if you can stay on the CLI. So if you're already a proficient Linux developer, then if you really wanted to, you could have an isolated world that exists in the WSL user space. That's entirely possible. Um, assuming you want to have that like mixed mode programming experience that I was showing, in that case, you start needing to get into VS Code, but really, as with so many other dev tools, the way you do development with a set of dev tools depends on what you're building more so than where you're building it. So like no development patterns and using NPM, I mean, whether you're working in WSL and VS Code or whether you're working on OSX with VS Code and the built-in terminal, I mean, those patterns are the same in both yep. places. So I really, yep. I guess, 
far enough to install the feature. Once you're there, I mean, it's pretty. Like Roll yep. and go. Yeah. yeah, like it's like enable developer mode, turn on the feature, and then I like install MVM. I first start with MVM, I install node, which gives me NPM. I install the yarn from the curl script, and then I install ZSH and then oh my Z shell. That's it. And that's like my entire environment. And like the only time I ever complain to her about something is like when I need like <laughs> GPU bindings. File and system performance. Yeah, or like file system <laughs> performance. <laughs> but like otherwise, like I don't yeah. think today, like looking back on like some of my first days or when uh, before I worked for Microsoft, they wanted me to try and pilot a Surface. Like I wouldn't have used it if I could not use Bash. So I will just say that. Uh, I can do everything that I can do today, and it's my primary development machine. Actually, so much that it led me to build a PC at home, and now I have like a savagely fast PC, PC that, oh, I love it, because you can just build whatever PC you want and have it be super fast, and coding experience is equally as uh, fast as well. Quick updates, you don't need to have developer mode anymore. Not anymore. Oh, yeah. nice! So you don't need to have developer yeah. mode anymore. Oh, yeah. The other cool. thing that we've done recently, and this is in like Windows Insider build, so this will come to you, peop you, you all <laughs> very shortly. Um, we've also made it so the Windows <laughs> Firewall is now aware of WSL. So if you install nice. SSH in WSL, you get like oh. friendly little tool tips that are like, do you want to let port 22 through? And you're like, yes, okay, cool. You know, so the same way you get firewall tool tips in Windows, you now yeah. also get those for Linux processes. Cool. So like every day, like the amount that you need to know to get going in WSL, like the barrier to entry less keeps going down and time. down. And yeah, give us feedback. We're really responsive to feedback. That's our jam. So it just keeps getting hotter and hotter. Yeah. That's right. So I also was very impressed with uh, this uh, ability to run uh, Linux in Windows. So of course, I would like to know a little bit history, uh, how this happened. Like, I guess it was pushed by a Docker, uh, which wanted to run pretty much containers. So maybe you have some other story. That's one question. And of course, it's interesting to know what's coming, because there are a lot of kind of topics. Uh, and uh, the question, uh, how uh, fast you can uh, make Linux uh, developer feeling at home in Windows? So do we expect like to get some maybe like different uh, like uh, Linux uh, uh, like file systems coming s uh, soon? Any support? Anything like what's coming in future? Um, okay, so, so breaking this second question. Yeah, so breaking this into two parts. The first question. What's the history behind this? So actually, this has been a really interesting thing. So Windows, since the dawn of time, has supported subsystems. So for people who are either supreme operating system nerds or have run Windows back in the Windows NT days, Win32 is actually a subsystem. And when Windows first shipped, it actually had a POSIX subsystem running on it. Um, but yeah, right? So that's been around for a really, <laughs> really, really long time. So the <laughs> idea of subsystems isn't at all new. Okay. So what kind of change that made WSL interesting and possible now is now Linux distributions are packaging up all of their user mode code in a container. You know, it's called a container. When you have all of the user mode code without the kernel, that's a container image. So now it's really, really easy for people like Ubuntu, so Canonical, or Fedora, or Debian, or Kali Linux. Like all of these people, if they have a container image, they already have exactly the packaging mechanism we need to run those things. So back when we first had the POSIX subsystem running on the NT kernel alongside Win32, so this is, you know, many, many moons ago when I was... <laughs> not yet doing development, but now I know these things because I work in Windows and I'm an operating systems nerd. Um, so back in those days, it wasn't really a good user experience because you had to recompile to run on the POSIX subsystem. It wasn't oh. something that had like apps. You didn't have package managers. You didn't have any of that infrastructure. So now that we live in a world where we can have that subsystem and also have these handily bundled distributions that have all of their user mode code in a tarball, now it's really easy to unpack that and run it on Windows. So that's the history that led up to it. Basically, technology is combined in a way that made something where you had two disparate things that have existed for a long time, came together in a really synergetic, I hate that word, I'm sorry, <laughs> came together in a really complementary way and it worked out well. Um, pretty, much con uh, pretty much Docker containers helped kind of to bring these yes. things together. So, Quick note, these are not containers. The similarities end with runtime. So the run capabilities are not a container at all, but the packaging is very similar to a container. Um, second part of the question, what's coming up? 
Honestly, we are trying to build really awesome integration experiences. We really want to fix file system perf because once the shiny, you know, like the fact that this exists, yeah. So, yeah, the NTFS, so the Windows. I'll be so excited when that's fixed. I know, NTFS I'll be so excited. is pretty, pretty slow with small file IO. So like opening and closing a million small files is pretty slow. Like NPM install. Yeah, like the NPM and yarn. We know that this is a problem. We're working on stuff like that. We want to start looking into being better at machine learning. Um, so new developer, developers who are coming into an ecosystem, like the Linux ecosystem right now, we want to make sure we're supporting them. We also want tighter, more integrated workflows, like the use WSL flag in VS Code has just changed me messing around with things that are honestly way above my stack level. But it's made it much easier and nicer to do. So we're working on integration, expanding to new developer types, so ML and other things, and yeah, improving the things that we have now. You keep handing it back to me, but I'm all sorry. the questions are for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, don't bother. It's like instinct. Yeah. Like, I'm done now. <laughs> sorry. Hold this. Adding Kali Linux was pretty cool to me because I used to remember like ha hacking on Kali Linux a bunch, like myself, and running around my neighborhood with little Wi-Fi access points trying to crack them. Yeah. But now you can do that through Windows. <laughs> adorable childhood. I know, know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so nerdy. Hi. Um, so I apologize. I don't know too much about Linux, but I was just wondering if something's possible. Uh, in this kind of WSL kind of architecture <laughs> thing, I know, like the I third question in a row, um, <laughs> is it possible to build like more sophisticated tools on top of this? I think you were all kind of getting at, but like, is it possible to have GNOME as like a desktop environment? <laughs> in Maybe. Okay. So um, this is an interesting like one. X people, server. yeah, people ask all the time, like, okay, so how do you get graphical things? Well, yeah. So we didn't want to make all of the images available in the store be VM sized because at that point we have VMs, you know, like, so we didn't want the images to be huge. And it turns out bundling those distros with all of the graphical tools available in Linux would make them huge. <laughs> so we didn't do that. With that said, you can run apt-get install GNOME, uh, apt-get install x11 tools, et cetera, et cetera. Those things are all still in the package manager. So you can do that yourself. Then the problem is we don't have a good way of viewing X stuff on Windows. The two that I've seen people use out in the world are either have an X serve running on yep. Windows, so you can download, and there are a number of them online. Mm -hmm. Download your favorite X server de jure, and you can just run stuff. You, so as long as you set your display to zero, and there are a million people who have done this online, so you can look it up and get great how-tos. So if you set display to zero in your bash RC file and you download XServe on Windows, you can absolutely view X windowing in from WSL. People have asked me, how do I get the full graphical desktop experience? Um, again, I would encourage you to think about VMs as an option if you really do want to run a full thing or you know install Linux. Like There are many options to do that. But I think that you could probably install XRDP server in WSL and then RDP to localhost. I think that would work. I haven't personally tried it, but I think that you could RDP to localhost with XServe running in WSL, and that would probably work. Okay. Try it. Tell I me. I will. Let us know, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Hello, users. Please give us feedback. <laughs> um, nice. Oh. Um, since, okay, there we go. Well, maybe, uh, like, I'm just trying to understand, uh, like, what we can expect in future with maybe like running Linux and Windows at the same time with extra memory now available and like maybe having option like Alt F1 and and so like pretty much changing console you can have Linux running natively and pretty much switching back to Windows at some point. So is like, <laughs> uh, this like uh, too uh, uh, futuristic, too fantastic to happen or it's? I, I, I do not know what the future holds. I would encourage you to look at VMs where you can do all of these things today and they work really well. Um, yeah, I don't know. But it's an interesting idea. It would be interesting to have quick keys to switch between. I mean, Windows is a platform. And so like, the whole point is that we look to the developers to create incredible integrations like what you're talking about. And so um, you know, I'm sure there's some WSL APIs that are surface well, to whack, right? I mean, now that you have like raw sockets for inter-process communication, you can have a Windows thing that uses, you know, AF Unix to communicate to WSL, you could probably embed that in a full screen thing. I think we have enough of the tools. Put it this way, if somebody wants to tackle that sort of project and you don't have the API services that you need, that is a type feedback. Like, we're right now in the stage with WSL where it's really new, we're building a pile of APIs, we're building a pile of tools, and nobody's created much on them yet. 
because it's new. I mean, people have created some amazing things, but stuff like AF Unix, that's in the past like six months. So, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, am, I am sitting here with bated breath waiting to have the problem that we don't have enough APIs surfaced for people to build cool things know, on top right? of WSL. <laughs> I mean, let me know if that's your problem. I would love to have that problem. Great problem. You could bring us the future yeah. of what's next. I, you I would do it. I'd add it's one you. thing to that, though. Like, uh, we make Windows, uh, and we don't necessarily want to make something that will make Windows obsolete. Um, it is our platform. Uh, yeah. So, like, there is a degree of, like, I'm not sure we would ever ship a user mode where you could just say, put me in Linux. Like, that might be <laughs> a little beyond where we want to go. Because um, then just use Linux, right? And like you can do that now. So I, it's not to say that I think your question is ridiculous, but like there is a ceiling, I think, to how far we go to making Windows like Linux. But I want to use Linux and be able to play no, games on no, my I dead get box it, I get at it, the I get same it. time. I'm just saying, like, realistic <laughs> expectations have to exist. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because you know, the people that created Wine, and it was always kind of challenging to run uh, Windows application on Linux. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much probably a future. Be just to uh, get the best of Linux and Windows mm. and kind of uh, use them together. Right, right. exactly. Yeah. Any other questions? Please. All right, questions? folks. Uh, I ah. have questions. Yeah. Ken? Yes, so you were talking about the Edge developer protocol, mm -hmm. and um, hopefully there is a lot of security in that because if you can hook up a UI to something that doesn't have a UI, um, I wouldn't want it phoning somewhere that hmm. I hadn't. So what kind of security do you have in that? Built into all what, of our fundamentals. When, when you say security and mention phoning home, do you mean like data privacy well, security or? I, I, I don't want to have a, an easily developable botnet, you know, on a refrigerator. Oh. Uh, <laughs> a Windows refrigerator. I appreciate you <laughs> putting us way out in that future vision that you have because we want to be there. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> if, if someday EDP is running on a refrigerator, we've done well, and that will be a problem oh, I'll happily tackle. Um, no, it's uh, to address the sort of underlying question. We're ta we take security very seriously. Yes. Um, in in this release that we're, we're nearing, um, there have not been any new security scenarios that we have introduced with EDP. It's just a different way of getting at the same things that you could access before. Um, perhaps easier, which one could argue is less secure, but I think security through obfuscation or misdirection is not truly security. These things were always, were always there before. Um, as we go and implement new things though that may, even if they are not unsecure, may leave a customer feeling as if they've been put into a position where perhaps they aren't secure, we try to predict those situations and put in mechanisms in place to deal with that. For instance, the UI when you launch Edge from the command line and DevTools is activated, we very purposely put that UI in there and made it pop up a, some people will argue, annoying layover that you have to purposely interact with and dismiss because we don't want it to be a surprise to you that you have this server now running on your machine that exposes all of your tabs to be DevTooled against. So. We very actively keep in mind, I mean, even part of how we release software is every time we release, we go through reviews for all the fundamentals and compliance areas that we ship. So security, privacy, accessibility, performance, um, the whole suite of, of, of sort of fundamentals. Um, we run them by security experts. We run them by privacy experts. We all take trainings um, on a litany of these things just because we know trust is extremely important and especially in today's sort of data economy we know that we as a browser through which you access most of your data um, edge is the number one used app on windows uh, so we take um well, okay sorry to say this aside from chrome uh, uh <laughs> crap uh data uh i'm being honest okay all right you asked for authenticity and honesty uh yeah uh, thanks, guys. Uh, we really we, we take it seriously. Um, we, we never want to have a Microsoft sort of security response incident where we sort of drop the ball. We know that we're humans will make mistakes, but we care 
a deep amount about not putting any of you guys into a compromised situation. So as best to our human abilities, yeah, we care very much about that. And we have systems in place that ensure that we, we don't drop the ball as much as possible. Really strict systems. Yes. Yeah. Ridiculously. Of which I'm an enforcer of one on my team. So like people can't release features without getting sign off and thing and they kinda hate me for it. But like this is the sort of fundamentals we drive through every feature we develop. Yeah.